from wherever you are, and welcome to Let's Play Games. I'm John McFarland, Adult Services Librarian for National Public Libraries, and I hope you'll join me in learning or rediscovering some of the more common and uncommon games out there. This time, we're going to go to my favorite game. It's played by millions around the world, and I want to introduce it to you, Mahjong. Let's get stuck in. I'm really excited to tell you about this game because it's we've dealt with cards before and we've dealt with 52 card decks quite a few in previous episodes. This time we're using a completely different set, tiles. So I want to help you picture this a little bit. Instead of four suits that we're familiar with a card deck, we've got three. So instead of the club, the diamond, the heart, and the spade, we're dealing with dots, uh, and I'll use this, bamboo sticks, remember this little owl, it'll be important later, and then also characters. This goes in a one through nine. There's no 10, there's no face cards. This is gonna be our starting point. And the object of this game is to collect melds or groupings. If you've played Rummy before, if you've played Go Fish, that's a meld. You're trying to create pairs or triplets in order to successfully build a small deck. This is the way that you win this game. Slowly, this is not typically a fast paced game, but it can be if you score really well because scoring is gonna play an important part here. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna take you bit by bit through this game. And I know these stacks could probably be very imposing to look at, but that's why we're gonna trim it down, take it piece by piece, and then show you how you can take these tiles, build a wall, deal it out, and then enjoy numerous hours of fun. So here's what we're gonna do. Uh, let me go ahead. Notice how this can get a little crowded, but there are four specific seats and I've got them labeled here. So the person who's sitting in the initial seat is in the east seats. So these wins are going to be important later. They won't be important right now, but we'll get there. But East Wind is the dealer. No matter what, East Wind is the dealer and it will rotate throughout. The next one, and I'm sure you're familiar with Cardinal Directions, you might think that this looks a little funny. It is. For some reason, it's flipped. The lore is that it's the way that you would look if you were sitting down outside, it would be that direction of winds. But it will be east, south, west, north. And with each successive hand, a lot depends on does the person who deals win the hand. And I'll talk a little bit about this more when I talk about the history of this game of how it developed. But the easiest way to explain it is that if you are the dealer, you have the potential of winning more points by winning the hand. If you lose the hand, you have the potential of losing more points and you lose being the dealer. Now, what we're gonna be doing is trying to create some melds into a hand. This is not a game that's played open, it is played close so people can't reveal what their pieces are and you wouldn't want to because you want to hide what you're looking for. You are going to be typically looking for four groupings of three in either a sequence like one, two, three, two, three, four, four, five, six, etc., or triplets, the three of bamboo. So if you have three of each individual one, that's not what matters here. You need a triplicate of these individual tiles. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna spend some time getting this ready and getting it set up. 
And then once we get to that point, I will show you exactly how we shuffle, deal, and then play around. But I want to take a step back because there's a long and fascinating history of the development of Mahjong. Let's show you. So Mahjong has a long, complex, and complicated history. We're gonna have to start at the very beginning. And I've talked before about card suit decks. So the money suited deck is one of the first instances we have of playing cards pretty much from antiquity. And we had what were three versions, cash, strings, and myriads referring to the coins that would be reflected in this paper. And it went up from one through nine, much like you see one through nine on these tiles, because 10 would equal the next segment up. This would be kind of the first version you really see of an organized deck, but more on decks in just a moment. So I went ahead and got these pieces out uh, just so you can actually see them. So we've got four sets of each of these tiles, one through nine of what we call characters, bamboo or sticks and dots, circles. You can phrase it however you want to, um, just as long as you agree on terminology here. There are some sets out there where the numbers won't be on here. Um, I like pieces being on here because I know these characters, but sometimes it's nice to not have to think about it. But in case you're ever confronted with it, it's mostly simplistic with these characters in kind of mnemonic way. So one, two, three is fairly obvious. Four has like four strokes on here. Five has a little like five-ish here on the core bit, uh, just with like an extended back. Six, I just put as a hand raised thing. Seven looks like an upside down seven. Eight has a hat. And nine is your squiggle. I know that's a rudimentary way to do it, but it does make it easier to kind of remember what you're dealing with. So you notice that these are, you know, fairly small. They have a nice little clicking sound to them, which admittedly is always kind of satisfying for me. But the way that you have our deal here is you're going to have it in a core area and it's going to involve however many people you have playing. You can technically play with two players or three players, which is just fine. Um, but four is the way we're going to explain this. And also an important caveat. This is just a tile set. There are many games that are surrounding it. I'm going to be playing what's called Rishi or Reach, Mahjong. It's a Japanese version, but it will help us understand a lot of the core concepts here. So what you're gonna do is we're gonna flip all of these over because part of this game is hiding the tiles. And you wanna make sure that every tile is flipped over. And since there's not a way to shuffle like a card deck, what you end up doing is you have to basically move these pieces around. Uh, this is where having friends to play with is always a good idea because this process can be done quickly and efficiently. So apologies that it takes a second on my end, but when you're doing this solo, sometimes it can take a second. So there's no hard or fast rule for how long you're supposed to shuffle or how complex the shuffling is supposed to be, just that you're shuffling as a group. And you'll move these pieces around just in a swivel motion. And inevitably you're gonna have pieces that'll flip back over, that's totally fine. Just flip them back over so that way nobody knows where a particular piece is. And since this is the first shuffle of the day, it may be a little uh, less on the random side than I would like it to be, but what you can do is have this in 
And then now we're gonna do what is the shuffle deck, uh, what we'll call building a wall. For this version, we're only gonna have 54 stacks. So because that's not our normal way of doing things, I'm gonna separate it out a little. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do 13 stacks to the non-dealer player and 15 to the dealer player. And what you'll do is you'll take a stack of two like this, put it here, and then you will progressively stack up. Now these I personally really like because it's got, oh wait a minute, have these on edge. So five, seven, nine, 11, 13, and 15. So normally if you have friends with you to play this, what's going to happen is you're going to get through this pretty quick because you can all be creating stacks at the same time. That's four, six, seven, nine, 11 and 13. And you're just gonna repeat this process and try and grab pieces from all around because the fact that it's in front of you is gonna matter a little bit less uh, because this is basically creating our random order in which the Tiles will move. Let's see, is it seven? Nine. And then Eleven. And this is always the point where I get concerned that I have dropped the tile somewhere because if you're familiar with cards, it's sort of the looking like you need exactly the right amount. So what you're gonna do here Notice how this is going to work out just fine. Is as a group, you'll move these in. So notice how it creates a small little square. So notice as I'm the dealer, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to roll this die. Uh, die rolling is important to determine where exactly you're going to break this wall. So what I'm going to do is I roll a three here. Now, in a normal game, this would impact whose wall you're breaking and which one you're breaking. But because we're just gonna go one, two, three, so we're gonna break it there. And what's gonna happen here is you need 10 tiles to start. So you're gonna take two stacks, and you're probably familiar with play being a clockwise thing, important concept to note here. Play moves counterclockwise. This is really important, it moves that way. So, we'll go ahead and flip everybody's over here. That's four up there. Four, and then another two stacks, so that brings us eight. And then when you get to the end of the wall, you'll just start breaking up this new one. And now what you're gonna do is take one stack each. So this will give you 10, exactly. Two more things. One, we're going to have you can technically have the ability to have four of a kind in this game. Uh, that is called a con, K-A-N. I wanna leave a little bit of room for there to be potentially a four of a kind. It's random, but it also does add the ability for some tiles won't be used. I'm also going to put in what's called the Dora. The Dora is gonna be flipped right here. And here's the important part of the, about the Dora. In this game, you only can make certain valid hands. These valid hands, which I'll go over in a second, have points allocated to them. This helps you score more points if you have the subsequent pieces. And the Dora indicator will not be that piece, but it will be the piece that's next to it sequentially. 
So we have the three of characters. So that little box piece that was the four, that will be our Dora indicator. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and show you what all went through one. We're gonna organize and then see what our pieces look like. So as a reminder, what we're looking for are three melds that can either be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, a sequence, and it doesn't go around, so nine, one, two doesn't count. We need one, two, three, or seven, eight, nine. Or a triplicate. We need three sets of those, and then a pair. And the pair can be of anything, it doesn't matter. So let's kind of organize this and see how close we are. Let's see, we've got a decent hand going here. We've got our dots, we've got a nine, we've got a five and a six. So we've got the one here, a three makes a sequence. A three could also make a sequence here at the four five. So we've got two what are called weights. I'm waiting on either a three or a six. Nine, which is kind of all on its lonesome, and a five, six. So let's be, we'll be optimistic here and say we're pretty far on the way. These are kind of the junk pieces for now until we find something better. So I'm gonna move over here. Uh, we can start looking at everybody's individual hand. And uh, normally you would be able to just place it on these racks here, but I'm gonna place it up here so you can see it better. So what we're gonna find being the all-seeing player here is that some pieces are gonna be a little more valuable based on how we have it here. So we've actually got a completed set here. This four, five, and six. You can just put it off to the side here. We've got two sevens, not bad. We've got an eight and a one. So we've got one set completely. That's situated, that's all good to go. Here, eh, they want the four over here. Well, one of the fours are here. They don't know that. And yes, some of these hands will end in a tie with no one winning. It happens sometimes. You will just reset and it will increase the stakes the longer a tie goes on. But we have also another nice little setup. You've already got the pair here. So this can either just be the pair or be a triplicate. So you've got options as you keep moving along. So now we are gonna flip it here. Let's see what we've got to work with on the west. There's our seven, so a triplicate becomes ever unlikely. We've got a three, we've got a nine. At least we have a pair here with the twos, which aren't bad. Seven. I'm not particularly liking this hand. If I am this player, we at least have some pairs going on and the starting of something. I'll just kind of put it here. But notice that the seven is here. And with the seven, it makes it ever harder for that to be happening simply because there are just fewer pieces out there. Now let's look at our final player's hand. Uh, lots of circles, which I don't mind one bit. So we've got the two, five, and six of characters. So notice how I'm just organizing it progressively. And I've at least got some set up. And once I get the pieces I need, I'm gonna keep it off to the side. If you're playing a game like this, you're obviously gonna wanna hide a little bit the pieces that you want. So you, you've at least got a core setup. And notice that we have 10 pieces here. And I said you needed three in a meld and two. How do you get the 11th piece? Well, here's the start of the game. You draw. So I just drew an eight. That will happen a lot, by the way. That doesn't help my ones, twos, four, five, five, six, and it doesn't help me get any closer. As we get to increasing complexity, 
you will be able to steal pieces under certain conditions from other people. In this version, you can only win one of three ways. The first one, by having a fully concealed hand. By not allowing you to steal, you're guaranteed to have that. So, hey, we're good. The second one is going to be when you are one piece away. So notice how they've already got almost two set up here. If they're one piece away and they just need, for example, the nine of characters, they can do what's called Rishi or Reach. And it's basically saying, I will win and I'm also not going to be doing anything except whatever is the item I win. I will discard literally anything. I can't improve my hand. I can't say, oh, I wanna do that now. You have to keep your hand as is. The third one is one of the core rules that you will see fairly often, and it's called all symbols. Here's the important part of these numbers before I give you a little bit more history. The ones and the nines, they're called terminals. For an all symbols hand to work, it has to be entirely made of the two through eight. No ones, no nines. So this is gonna be the core of a lot of what are valid hands in the main game once we get to the full version. But I wanna take a second, I'll do a refresh before we get back started, but there's so much more history to this game and I have to tell you about it. A little bit more depth now that we've talked about the basic deck. We have to go into the game of Ma Diao, which was based in China, and it was used as a way to take what we refer to as tricks, similar to rummy or whist. So we're trying to gather little groups together. Also important would be the concept of the banker. So it would be one person who is in charge of all of the dealing, and the other three players were their opponents. This is gonna start sounding eerily similar to the person being the dealer in Mahjong. So this is our current base, and we see this go all the way to the 16th and 17th century, where it evolved again, but more on that in a minute. Okay, so a quick refresh, restart. We only got to shuffling and taking of the first piece. Let's talk about hand construction here. We talked about it a little bit in last segment too, I will absolutely concede that, but we're looking for the three valid ways to win. A fully concealed hand with three melons and a pair, and it has to be fully concealed since we can't steal any pieces. So we're doing good to start off. Secondly, the all simples, the ones and the nines are nowhere near it. That is a valid hand, and that will be a valid hand all throughout our playthroughs. So this is why I'm starting with these little three easy ones to start off with. I will add more as we go along, but most of the ones I'm gonna show you are not the fantastic thousands of point hands. It's just simplistic, easy to start with, and we'll add more complexity as we go on. So kind of keep this handy as a reference for simples, Rishi being one tile away, making your bet, and a fully concealed hand. So let's look at what we drew. We drew that eight here. And you've kind of got this six and the eight here. So if you get lucky enough to get a seven, uh, is there any out on the field right now? There's that one right there. So we know that there are only three more that can be drawn. And I forgot to add one little interesting bit about the Rishi element to it. When you're one away, just one away, you can actually win off of an opponent's discard. This is where it becomes cool and changes how the points are calculated. If you draw the tile yourself, that's what's called a sumo, self-draw, or ron if it's off an opponent's discard. So if I get to one away and I make my Rishi bet and then somebody drops the piece I need in discard, this will be in our version the only time that that works. So what I'm gonna do is, don't see anything here with my nine, so we'll go ahead and draw that. As we get to 
the main version, it'll be important as to what suits you have, because if you have all of one suit, that's worth more. So basically, the more complex the hand is, the more points it's worth. So what'll happen is, remember, we're going counterclockwise here, and let's see what we get here. Here's a four. So this opens up to a little more possibility. I'm definitely keeping that one. And that nine, I don't know if I'm gonna build anything off of that, so we'll just discard the eight here. And what you're gonna do is just put it in front of you. Uh, as we get to more complex versions of this game, it's gonna look a bit more crowded, but for now, we start off simple. Now we're to West Wind. So they drew this one, and notice this one really isn't a help. They aren't constructing anything off of it, so they're gonna go ahead and discard that. Now this tells this player over here that they may have to drop that one now, depending on whether they can draw it or not. So we got the nine of characters here, which isn't really a help. Uh, we'll go ahead and just go ahead and discard this nine. More often than not in this version, since all simples is one of the valid hands, typically it ends up being that lots of ones and nines. Uh, we got our seven here. So this is a nice little draw. We're six, seven, eight. So we've got a completed one. We're gonna go ahead and move this over to the side. Um, and seeing that nine being discarded, it's like, okay, we're probably not gonna have to do that. So I'll go ahead and discard this nine. This is a signal to everybody here that probably not gonna have a triplicate of nines, so that's out. And seven, eight, nine sequence, unless somebody already has it, is out. And I'll note this here, I've got this five, six, so I'm edge waiting for four or seven. I'm also hoping for this three or six. And part of the reason why I'll be kind of wary of getting rid of either of these, and I'm more willing to throw this one away, is because if I get a three, I can add it to this four or five, and the two is the pair, then I'm one away. So notice how quickly a hand can develop, and this game is all about developing your hand as fast as possible. We don't have that many draws, so we've gotta work with what we can. So that nine gets discarded. Our one, uh, we'll go ahead and throw away this one right here, since that's already out of play. Our eight, which improves. There we go. Now we've got a little more to work with. And we'll do either the three or the seven. Let's go ahead and do the seven. So right here, that discard tells me that this is more than likely gonna be a pair at this point. Uh, unless we get lucky enough to draw the seven naturally, which hasn't happened yet. So typically I'll kind of put that off to the side of like, okay, that's, that's the hand, that's fine. Uh, we've got our three. So now we've got a pair here, not bad. Our one, maybe you want to keep that. We're gonna discard the most extraneous piece, the two. And notice how this keeps going in a pattern. And now actually I'm really liking this because now I've got two options. I can either discard this five and hope for another four, or we can have a three, which could make us like one, two, three, and hope for another three, but I'm gonna more than likely just go ahead and discard this one, especially since I know this two's not available, so triplicate's unlikely. One of the threes is already here. Also, I've got two fours. Remember that Dora that I talked about? Now it comes home to roost where this is gonna be worth a whole lot if I can win the hand. So we'll keep going, seven. So now we've got five, six, seven, a pair, another pair, and our three, four combo. We'll go ahead and discard this one because that's really not gonna help us unless we draw two and three, which is pretty unlikely at this stage. So notice how game will actually move pretty quickly as we go along. I'll just keep that since it's close. And that's why usually these games really move fast in the grand scheme of things. I'll discard this one. And you'll move progressively around the table and go for what you think works. 
And the reason that I'm moving a little faster is because now at this point, I'm kind of waiting for something to be valuable enough. Uh, so notice this four, which is of no help to this player, would have been significantly helpful. And in our main game, we'll get to that next episode, there's a way to take that piece, but there's a catch to it. So now they know that this is gonna be a pair. We've got our one here, which is again, no help. We do realize that this would have been my pair, but alas, there's nothing much we can do about it. The two, which is gonna be helpful. Now I've got a decision to make. I've already got the five, eight, do I want to wait for four? There's currently no four dots in play, so that's not bad. Uh, now we're starting to look like we could pretty much have just a straight on. I've already got a pair here. Four's out, so now there's one, two, three. There's only one more four out there, so that's looking unlikely. And if I'm this player, I'm noting that four and someone's probably holding on to that if they get it. I want the opportunity to use that door if at all possible. Uh, this is where I always get indecisive, uh, but I'll say this five, I won't have the five leave. Normally, if I'm playing a game and we're playing the version where pieces can be stolen, I'm more than likely gonna put that eight out there because an eight's already been discarded, which means it's relatively safe. Now we're back on here. Nine, another pair that you could have lost. So this is where random chance comes into play. Nine, no help. You could have had that seven, eight there. Six, mm, that would have been nice. And the reason I'm discarding the six is because if we draw a seven, there's seven, eight, nine right there. So more often than not, this game actually can sometimes also be fairly quiet, um, typically because people can move fairly quickly. The fact that I am just being a single player here. Uh, and the nine I'm gonna discard only because I still wanna go for that all simples. Sometimes I like keeping that, but since all simples is one of the valid hands, I'm gonna keep that alive as long as possible. One, now we know that all of the ones are out. So no one is going for two, three, four. So say you're waiting for a one on this end, maybe you had a two, three and didn't have the four, you may have to make some decisions based on what you see on the discard of what's going to happen next. So, uh, and actually do this. Each row should be about six. Now you're really starting to make some decisions. Uh, I'll go ahead and discard that one. Our three, which isn't a help. Our nine, which is also not a help. And I now have on the field three nines that I drew. And this will happen a lot where the discard that you are looking for or would have been really helpful to build a hand is gonna be sitting in your discard pile. And notice I'm making a second row here. Uh, just put six to a row, that way you can see what's going on here. And we're gonna keep rapidly going around. Uh, there is the triplicate that they needed. So that's locked in. Now you've really got to make a decision as to what you're looking for and what you're waiting for. You know a five's been discarded, you know a three's been discarded. Everything is going to be, at this point, kind of a risk. Uh, so we're just going to go ahead and discard this three, and we're going to hope for a four. Now we get the eight of characters, which, again, is not really help unless I'd kept that nine from earlier. The two. So notice that this is the last piece. Uh, because it's concealed, if they had drawn it, they would have been able to declare con. That con would have given them this piece. So whatever this piece is, we'll reveal it at the end, is gonna be given to them and that will function as their piece. They still have to discard that turn, but play would go to them. But we'll talk about that more later. So now we've got our one of character, which is again, no help. And notice now that it, 
now that I know that something isn't help, I can discard it pretty quickly. And this person's not too happy. Notice I've got a five, which would have been really helpful had I not discarded the nine. I would have just needed a four. So at this point, we'll just kind of keep going along. Our six. Now, there's a seven out there. There's one seven left in the pile, it looks like. So now you're gonna do six, seven. Well, there's multiple eights out there. So that's probably not gonna work out well. A one, which is of no help. A five. So notice how we can just play this game real quick. So now we're cooking. We got a five, six, seven, and a six, seven, eight. And now I'm waiting on one of two things. Either a four or a two. This five, we could also take this way. It costs us one Dora. And since all we're looking for are three melds, we're good to go. I'm gonna to wanna to maximize my chances. There's a six in the discard, there's a three in the discard. There's a three there, so one, two, three. There's one more left. There's six, there's three more potentially left. One of them is there. So I'm gonna go and discard this. And this is the point where I would wanna declare reach. Even though there's not much left, if anyone discards that three or six, this player wins. Uh, so one, no help. Three, not really help since they've already got that triplicate there. The one, which is also no help. And they manage to self draw. So with this person would then declare sumo. I have won the hand by self drawing. You have to reveal it immediately. We have a pair, three, four, five sequence, six, seven, eight sequence, five, six, seven sequence. This is all simples, Rishi, completely self-drawn with Adora. So from here, I'm not gonna talk about scoring this episode, but this is kind of the core concept of, you can just progressively add in how many complexities of hand you win. This is a simple version. Also in talking about the Dora at the very end, and by the way, revealed, that would have been the con piece they had gotten, which also would have been a no help. You will look at that piece and this piece under. That piece also now becomes a Dora and a nine, which doesn't help here. This is the way that as you play more often, you'll see how this game develops into just a simple, trying to find the patterns, getting to the patterns as quickly as possible, and getting it in the most complex way. A little bit more history to tell you about, and then I'll let you go for the day. Before I go too much further into the tiles, I want to talk a little bit about why we have these decks being as small as they are. There was the concept of stripped decks. These were before we really had fully organized face cards or the court cards as we became familiar with. So ace through 10 really became easier to just put on one group. Also, this is a time before mass printing. So 40 cards are a whole lot easier to produce than 52 cards. This would be a lot of the basis for quite a few games, not just Mahjong, well, well into the 16th, 17th, and even 18th centuries before mass printing could really take off. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks for tuning in. Now, this was just a basic version to teach some of the core concepts. Next time, I'm gonna up the complexity a little bit. You may see quite a few more of these pieces next time. See you then.